paint a little picture of what you each have done. Um, you have Rent the Runway, which has been on the Disruptor 50 list four times. It was originally known for enabling women to rent outfits for a big one-time event. But now, over half of your revenue comes from your subscription service. The ability to have unlimited access to all sorts of different clothing items. And then you have Revzilla, which has totally changed the way people shop or buy and experience content around anything motorcycle related. Both of these are categories um, that didn't really exist online before you created them. So I'd love to hear how you think that these companies, um, or how you sort of approach the creation of these companies um, to be so transformative. Um, Maureen, let's start with you. So explain to us how you changed the whole business now twice, especially the subscription model. So I think you know all great innovation comes from your own customers in some way. So you know, as you so perfectly described, you know, the beginning of our business was really getting women dressed a few times a year for the most special occasion, and that was a really powerful, great business. It grew really organically because it turns out women are really honest when someone compliments them. And when she was wearing something great from Rent the Runway, she not only said, this is X designer, but I got it from Rent the Runway, and oh my gosh, this is amazing service. So, you know, we were on a great trajectory. But really what our customers were telling us is, I want to do this all the time. You know, I have to go to work every day, I have to get dressed for all these different use cases in my life, or I'm pregnant, or I'm changing sizes, and why can't I rent more of my closet? And so for us, it was really, how do we create this subscription business to really empower her to have access to an unlimited closet? And there were some kind of macro forces working in our favor. So the rise of social media, everyone's kind of a celebrity of their own life, and everyone's worried about repeating outfits in a way that, that really wasn't a problem um, in, in the past. And then, you know, I think there's obviously 75 million working women in the U.S. that's only growing, and more and more people are moving to cities. And the reality is that people want to own less stuff. You know, there's a real reason why all of these sharing economy companies are accelerating, is that it's, we're solving a, a consumer behavior shift that is real and, and it's happening. So, you know, for us, the, the subscription business has been game changing and that we went from serving our customers a few times a year to now the average engaged subscriber is wearing our clothing 120 days a year. So it's just, you know, transformed everything that we do in the company in a really exciting way. Now, Anthony, you built the business for yourself. You saw a demand that was represented by your own interest. Walk us through your origin story. So our origin story is my background is technology and I spent some time in e-commerce and right around the time I was 25 or 26, um, it's really funny because my dad's in the back of the room right now, but he was, there, we, I was never allowed to have a motorcycle. Mom and dad said no. So 25, 26, you're gonna buy your first bike, your fresh eyes to this, it's expensive, it's dangerous, it's emotional, it's supposed to be cool and fun. And around the time I was buying the bike, I realized there was no great retailer outside of a dealership, which is mom and pop, or some really flighty online spots that you could buy with a high degree of confidence and have somebody really help you understand what you needed. So what we ended up doing, myself and two friends, um, we started the business to kind of solve our own pain point. So we started this business and really quickly realized that all the questions we were asking as new riders were questions that weren't adequately being addressed in the marketplace online. I like to think the biggest thing that we did to allow us to figure out our customer pain and solving that pain journey was really thinking about what are they trying to figure out, what are we trying to figure out, and then how do you scale that? Scale what somebody would have at a great dealership buying helmets, jackets, accessories, and how do we help them through that considered purchase life cycle? So that was really all things related to understanding, becoming a resource, that was really the cornerstone of how we built the business. Now you face, both of you face challenges dealing with suppliers. You had to convince um, fashion designers, they weren't going to be cannibalizing their own business by getting you access to clothes. And Anthony, you had to convince these motorcycle makers and, and that they should allow you to sell their products. And then you also had to convince consumers that they should trust you and they're making very big financial investments. How do you build that kind of trust? Oof. So in my opinion, trust with the consumer and with your vendor, right? It's the actions have to speak louder than words. And those decisions that represent what you say you're gonna do have to be done consistently over time. For us, the biggest thing we did was, if you look at the consumer, they're used to having somebody sell them something that benefits in that moment 
the retailer that sold them. And the vendors are saying, listen, you're gonna discount our product, you're gonna try to cram us down the scale as soon as you have any leverage over us. What we did was, we said, how can we align our interests with both the consumer and our vendors for the longer term? So we decided to share sell-through data and customer insights with the brands we work with. And with our consumers, we said, listen, if you need a tire patch kit versus a new tire, we're not gonna tell you that's why we made that choice, but we're gonna do that every time you interact with us, whether it's digitally, text, email, phone call. And I think that if you look at the brand trust factor, it really just becomes kind of good barbecue. It's low and slow, you do it over a long period of time, and at the end, it's the brand equity and reputation you've built. So that was our approach. But so ultimately you ended up sharing all this data with your suppliers, it made sense. I know you also shared data with your designers, which I think is really interesting. But um, before we hear about that, I want to hear Anthony, what that moment was where you got them on board. Because it must have been hard to, you know, you're offering them data, but they're like, well, based on what? I mean, was it hard, a hard negotiation? Or was there a moment when it all of a sudden clicked with them? So the motorcycle universe in North America is predominantly male, run by a handful of small companies. It's been around forever, and we were, quote unquote, young guys using the internet. I mean, we might, it was very heretical kind of going into it. People were definitely afraid of us. I think it took a few steps of us presenting them with that value and saying, hey, listen, this is what we've done, or, you know, a little bit of the little bighorn, start with the B and C list brands that were a little, they needed us as much as we needed them, and then you kind of back into the more premier brands that were more skeptical, we don't need you until they're left out of the conversation. So that was a little bit of creating that value and then creating a bit of FOMO to then have the bigger, more prestigious brands want to work with us. Maureen, is it hard for you the bigger you get, you pose a more of a threat? I mean, if women are saying they're not buying clothes anymore because they're subscribing to your service, how do you take that and then still get more companies to sign up to give you a product? It's a great question, but it's actually been the exact opposite for us. So as we've grown momentum, you know, we've really just grown our relationships with designers. So we partner with over 500 designers now um, that you can experience on Rent the Runway, and there's really three primary reasons. I think number one, the designers are in business with us because we're growing. So I think growth is a very attractive thing um, for any partnership. And obviously they trust us and that those relationships took time to build. The fashion industry is a small industry, but their traditional distribution channels are shrinking. And we're showing up and saying, we have more demand than we can handle. We need 10X than what we had last season. So that's been huge. And if they see us as a new distribution channel, with that comes new customers. So the average apartment store customer is in their early 50s. So you know that's who are buying their clothing and that's where it's being distributed. They're not reaching that younger customer. Even though they have great social followings and they're a well-known designer brand name, they aren't seeing that resonate in the world of their business. So for us, 98% of our customers are trying a brand that they've never worn before. And oftentimes they're falling in love with that brand, they're figuring out how that brand fits them. So we really are a marketing channel for the 500 designers that we work with. And then, you know, the data piece, I think a lot of people say that, but for us, it's data on two sides that our designers really find valuable. One is really the inventory IP. So we're a utilization business more than we are an e-commerce business. We're turning the stress many, many times and we're getting structured data every single time it turns. So we're actually passing on that data to the designer around how does this fit at different sizes? How could it you know, hold up longer? And, and that's not data they get. Or someone's returning, returning it unworn because it's and why. And you know, I, I find the designers and the business people that work with, with creative people, like they love that information and they wish that they had partnerships that were giving them that scale of information um, in their history. And then obviously, you know, customer demand data and really understanding what people are reacting to and what they're falling in love with. So it's been awesome to grow kind of that B2B part of our business and that we've been able to, I think, grow the value that we're delivering to the partners as we're offering more overwhelming value for our subscribers. And then, of course, there's the relationship with the customer. And you said that you mentioned women walk around in their, their own advertisement. Um, I'm curious how social media plays into that. Are people tagging and how important is that for you to spread? I mean, we are so fortunate and that just all of our growth has really been organic and people talking about the behavior of renting and really normalizing the behavior that I think, you know, even five or six years ago didn't seem so normal. Um, so yeah, one in six customers post a detailed photo review where not only does she post a photo but gives like, super detailed information like her weight and her bra size and like 
I can't even believe that people are willing to give us this information, but she sees that she's a part of a community. That was the part of the experience that was the most valuable to her, and so she wants to pay it forward. Anthony, you really built your community on YouTube. Talk yep. about the decision to do that. What sparked that initially, and how did you figure out how to leverage that? Sure, that's that extra marketing leg of the stools, right? So we talk about value back to suppliers, and I love what you just said because I agree with you. It's not about sell-through data, it's about unique insights that allow them to tailor their lines. But then for us, when it you know it tipped at a different level when we started spinning up the media component. Originally it was, can we help someone explain, or can we explain to someone how something works so they're more qualified and educated when they call us, and then we can potentially convert them easier, right? It was really about selling things. But it really shifted over time to become an authority play. So where we, came, we became more like consumer reports in our space, to where we were then the beacon of trust and authority to help somebody navigate that space. So that was a marketing tool. It was super value add for the customer. I had a customer one time say, it's like, you're the same price as everybody else, but we get all of these additional things. And that weapon, as a, a point of competitive differentiation, coupled with the fact that then we can go back to our vendors and say, can you co-op dollar? Can you subsidize? Do we get better gross margin? Do we have insight into what's coming down your product development life cycle faster so we can plan for it? It's this virtual cycle, or virtual cycle of value add, back and forth between vendor, customer, and us is really this indispensable resource with a lot of control in the middle. I mean, you know, put our good guy hat on, but we had a lot of sway within the industry because I think we, we positioned ourselves for the right reasons to own the customer. And it's interesting, um, when we were talking before this, you, we talked about the idea of reverse logistics. All the things that the customer doesn't see that makes the experience better and makes them so committed. When you thought about building this company or as you were getting it off the ground, do you think about building a community or is that something that's sort of played into it later? So at the time that we started the business, so we incepted, our first full year was 2008, and you had at that time, the next couple years, was really when Zappos blew up, and you started thinking about how communities work within retail and then the specialty retail aspect. But there was a company called Bodybuilding.com that's been around since the early 2000s. It was a, a sister company of QVC at one time in the same group, Liberty Interactive. And looking at that community piece, we looked at it, customer service, curated content, and community is really this that was the moat because everything we sold, you could find in other places. We didn't verticalize until after really we were acquired and it became part of the larger group was this verticalized product development component. I mean, Revzilla has just launched its first house brand. So back then, the only way you could do it was through service level content community and how engaged our consumers were with us because speed, price, and selection were really commoditized. I mean, if that was going to be our go-to-market, then pick a new sport because Amazon's already won. So let's talk about Amazon, the, the gazillion pound gorilla in the room, and the idea of building moats against Amazon. When you start, I mean, when both Rent the Runway and Revzilla started, Amazon was already a force, now it's a dramatically bigger one. Uh, how do you think about building those moats? I, mean, I think for us, we are laser focused on the unique and differentiated service that we think we're providing. So, you know, there are many retailers, and with the growth of fast fashion, fast fashion, you know, people are buying more stuff than they ever bought. So in 1990, the average American woman had bought 40 articles of clothing. In 2017, she bought 68. But the, the spend level hasn't gone up. So we're, we're buying more, but lower quality and cheaper, right? Um, and the utilization is going down. So 80% of a woman's closet is worn less than three times a year. So, you know, for us, that to us is the real need that we're trying to solve, and that's that universal feeling that every woman feels when she opens up her closet and feels like it's full of stuff and she has nothing to wear, right? And so, you know, Amazon is obviously getting you to buy a lot of stuff. Um, and get it to you in 24 hours. Totally, and, and competing on fast and convenient, and, and they're brilliant, and I think there's so many things that they do that, that obviously we study and learn from, um, but for us, it's really, we don't want you to buy stuff. We want you to, our vision for the future is 50% of the closet will be rented. It does not make sense for us to own all this stuff and not wear it. And, um, you know, we just are making sure that we are doing that in the most magical, convenient, awesome way possible. But do you feel a pressure to improve the logistics, to improve the, so, so that if Amazon were to try to get into your business or were to sort of try to, you know, copy it in any way, shape, or form, you would be ahead from a logistics perspective. Yeah, I think anyone's naive that, that isn't thinking about how to future-proof their business against any competitors. What's unique about what we do, 100% of what goes out comes back to us. And the goal is how do we turn it around as quickly as possible in perfect condition. 
So, you know, that is really where all of our proprietary technology, everything that we build in our warehouse, and you know, we're the world's largest dry cleaner. So, you know, there is some real special sauce in, in what we feel like we've created and had to scale to dress women 120 days a year. And, you know, we believe that if we keep focusing on that that um, and being able to deliver her clothing at the pace that she's requesting from us, we're going to just even further strengthen that competitive level. And Anthony, how did you think about protecting against Amazon? I mean, it's a different price point. A lot of the things you sell are a different price point. But so, did it, was it always in the back of your head? Uh, absolutely. Um, at the time that we started, like I said, it was only 10 years ago. So Amazon was there. They were the great white shark. They've been for a really long time. I, I would give a similar answer. I used to frame it out by saying it's the last 10%. So if so, there's two kind of pieces that Amazon's going to do. There's the I need a break pad, which is the um, non-differentiated purchase. I'm not I'm not angling to get that person purchase. If I grade it, get it great, like selling a tire, it's a consumable, it's a loss leader. If we get that sale great, we don't want to send anyone to Amazon. But when you think about considered or differentiated purpose or purchases, Amazon's not going to go the last ten percent. They're the pieces that are unique to the use case, that buying use case. Um, to your point, it's specific things to how that product needs to be bought, returned, how that product buying experience happens. We said, can we use technology and content to differentiate there in a way that Amazon's gonna say that's differentiate or that's diminishing returns for us. Mm -hmm. We won't go to the final 10% and really own that place in the customer's mind where, yeah, if you need a toaster, diapers, and a brake pad, go buy and prime on Amazon. When you need help with a helmet or a jacket or something that has to save your life and it's gonna cost you $500, that's when you're done screwing around and go have that solved by the guys at Revzilla that will solve that unique customer use case for you. And for us, it was consistently performing at a high level across all the touch points that go into that multi-touch, multi-day, sometimes multi-month journey for a customer. So it's, I would say it's the, the last 10% is how, you know, Amazon's gonna do certain things, but they're not gonna take it as far as an endemic specialty retailer or specialty provider in a specific industry will. Uh, it's interesting because if you look at Amazon, not only are they a sort of threat from a retail perspective, but they're now the third biggest digital advertiser in the United States. So that's a massive thing. So they're behind only Facebook and Google, they're number three. Now, this is obviously appealing from a perspective for uh, retailers. Retailers who want to advertise, even if they're not selling on Amazon, they can advertise on Amazon. When you look down the road, could that become an even bigger threat if Amazon were to say downgrade ads or hide you know, content? if you're not actually selling on Amazon directly? I think, listen, audience is, is critical, right? So if you wanna grow and you wanna accelerate your business, you have to have a world-class experience differentiated and you know, deliver unique value and then people have to know about it. So I think not just Amazon, but Facebook, Google, I and mean, there are massive players that control the audience. And all of us are you know, having to play in those platforms and we'll, we'll have to. And um, I think that, that that's just not an Amazon specific. I think that's just where the audience is and the addressable market and, and trying to capture the Bible. So speaking of Facebook and Google, at CBC's NetNet conference last week, Neil Blumenthal from Morgan Parker, he said he believes the Facebook-Google duopoly has made it harder for startups to get viral marketing without spending big. He said Morgan Parker could not have taken off as easily or at all. Do you think that's true? Is this a terrible time to start an e-commerce business? So the rent on digital advertising is only going to be increasing. I mean, every year it's gotten less efficient, and that's the duopoly of Facebook and Google. There was a great Inc.com article that came out in the last six months that said CA's cap is the new rent. So I've got all these um, digitally native vertical brands like Warby Parker, and you look now and you say, okay, well, the pound of flesh that goes to Google and Facebook, and we're getting less insight, the cost per acquisition is only going up, you're only deleveraging there. So then how do you make your customer, how do you become part of their life so they come back more frequently? And then how do you reach them in a way, in a channel that you own so that you can stave off those rent increases over time? And that's why we're seeing lots of DMVBs. I mean, it started, I feel like the first one that really hit my radar was Bonobos. It opened up guide shops. Great, go to where the people are that don't have a, that rent's more efficient than the digital cost of acquisition. And you that's have, the yeah, yeah. I mean, I started my career at Google in 2004 building AdWords. So, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. I think there's there's two things. Like Neil's point is a great one. I think it's not only the platforms and, and their challenge and navigate, but it's also talent, right? The pool of people that actually know how to navigate these platforms is really small and we're all competing for that talent. Yep. So it's really hard to find them. It's really hard to keep them. Uh, because they have all the opportunity in the world. It's no different than incredible engineering or product talent. You know, it all comes down to people. 
even though we talk about these platforms like these monolithic things, you know, it's people that execute results within these environments. So I think that's a huge component, but obviously stores for us, um, you know, are a huge cost savings driver for us because the customer is, at, is serving his last mile, but they have a huge impact on people really understanding what our brand's all about, really experiencing this, the quality of clothing, and, and really being able to try things on. So I want to let Tyler jump in here with a question. I have, I have more questions, but we'll get we'll some audience the, questions. A couple of the audience questions, and, and the people have really mastered Slido. Let's get to the first question here uh, that, that you asked. Will Patron tequila be served after the event? I know, that's what I'm saying. Everyone wanted to know, where are you so well, relevant. My answer is, I don't know. But here's one that is a serious question. And it's kind of one you just touched on. Brick and mortar has floundered for years, but still accounts for the majority of sales. What is driving online retailers to start to open physical stores as Warby Parker has? Yeah. And Oops. as we just mentioned, yeah. Yeah, so for us, it's, it's really, it's bringing the experience to life. So, our customers see the store as an extension of their physical closet. So, and with the subscription business, that is just 10 x So we've had to change our store hours to be open as early as 7.30 in the morning because customers want to come into the store before work to get their outfit for work that day. The store has to stay open until nine o'clock because she wants to come to the store last after she's gone to the school cycle class and worked out and got her dinner. So, you know, I think for us, just watching the customer use the store with that frequency and the traffic to our store is up tremendously. And we're really obviously trying to utilize technology in the store to make it as convenient and seamless as possible. So, you know, self-service checkout, um, anything that we can do to, you know, time is our busy working woman who is our customer. It's the most valuable asset. So the store and that experience just has to be flawless. Another one for Rent the Runway. What do you do with clothes that go out of style? Do you purge your in inventory? And another questioner asked, what do you do with clothes that come back damaged, yes. stained, uh, worn? Great questions. So very few things come back damaged or stained. Uh, it is shocking to me. When I got to the company three years ago, I, I couldn't believe the quality of that which our community and customers return things in. So that is not a massive problem in our business model. And we have the best dry cleaning experts in the world that know how to get out any stain. I wish I could bring all of my dry cleaning to our dry cleaning facility because they are world class in quality um, care of garments. On inventories that goes out of style, the reality is what's in style is highly relevant. So, you know, whether something just came off the runway and is in that season versus something that we've had on the site for multiple years, we see high demand and utilization. So I, I think the diversity of our customer base and what brands they gravitate to and what styles they want, um, obviously seasonality and weather differences, that really um, isn't a massive challenge for us as a business. And I just want to sneak in, can I sneak in one last question for Anthony, because I know he, he made a special trip here today from a board meeting, I believe it was from Go GoPuff. So Anthony yeah, sold- Yeah, I'm breaking China left uh, and right, yeah, right so now. Gold, uh, you sold Revzilla, now you're investing in startups, yep. one of which is a, a sort of unusual kind of retailer called GoPuff. Just tell us, because I know we're almost out of time, the number one most important thing you learned from Revzilla that you're now applying to GoPuff and your other investors. So it's, it's universal. If you're in B2C, it's great to provide consumers with vitamins, things that they love, that make them feel good, that's fine. But in my eyes, it's way more valuable if you can be a painkiller. So for Revzilla, the pain we solved was what people needed to know to buy something. At GoPuff, it's you're solving pain by creating a time saving. It's extreme convenience. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, it's the convenience store space. Everything you can buy at a Wawa plus beer, wine, and liquor delivered in and around 30 minutes app driven. There are 50 markets, over 500 employees at this point. That is solving extreme customer pain. If I don't want to leave my house, I'm hungover, I'm studying, whatever, but it's there fast enough to where they react, they stick, they become super loyal. And to me, that's their vote against Amazon. Amazon's gonna do a huge Prime Now category, and they're gonna say we're one to two hours. GoPuff's gonna say we're not everything, it's convenience store plus alcohol, and it's probably 30 minutes. That would be, that, I mean, that's where you look for that angle that is defensible over time. Defensible. Tyler, are we out of time? I think we're out of time, but I, I like the idea of everything you can get.